event. Give us an idea of how much planning would have gone into this funeral that's about to take place. Um, it is enormous, Charles, as you can imagine, because this is an unprecedented event in terms of its size and the implications of uh, particularly Queen Elizabeth II dying. And it falls under a pre-considered and pre-prepared plan, which is called Operation Lion, which is an overarching plan that addresses any issue of uh, a member of the royal family potentially dying, either in the UK or overseas for that matter. And in this instance, obviously for Her Majesty the Queen, the plan is Operation London Bridge. Now, I've been to, lucky enough to go to the United Nations General Assembly during Leaders Week. I've been to the Olympics at times. And I can tell you the, the feeling on the ground here, for security at least, is it isn't as in your face. There's certainly lots of officers, lots of security, but it doesn't feel uh, as oppressive as other world events. Is there anything in comparing uh, those kind of events scale-wise? Where does this sit? Well, I think in, in many regards, the policing and how this has actually been presented has been done in a, a very, very community integrated way. It's, it's obviously an event that a lot of people are going to want to attend. Uh, the anticipated numbers are in excess of one and a half million people will attend, obviously, the event in London on Monday. Uh, however, having said that, you know, this is a huge, huge, huge event. We've never seen anything of this size. I mean, even if you combined the Olympics in 2012, the London Marathon, all the various royals um, weddings in the last 20 years, uh, even if you put them all together, it doesn't reach the same size in terms of importance and scope as this one does. Multiple heads of state, kings, queens, uh, princes, presidents from around the globe, including Joe Biden, Isaac Herzog, you know, high profile uh, heads of state coming. How much do they complicate and where do their own security fit in with uh, the police on the ground here? Well, as you might imagine, you know, certainly in terms of the heads of state, quite often you will maybe get a cluster of them that may come over for, say, a G7 meeting or a, some particular conference. But we're looking in excess of 500 VVIPs that will be coming in. Now, as you say, they will have their own security. And having looked after a number of former heads of state myself and taken them to events around the world, you know, they will obviously coordinate with their counterparts in that particular host country. And here in the UK, we have enormous amounts of experience in dealing with visiting heads of state uh, and former heads of state and have certainly the plans down to absolutely fine detail. So many of those teams will feel very confident. There are only three exceptions on those heads of state in terms of them being able to actually have their own personal security details uh, escort them through, and that is obviously President Biden, it's the Premier of Israel and the Emperor of Japan. But all the other heads of state have to fall under the, the, the remit of Metropolitan Police and their protective command. Uh, give us an idea of how many officers there will be on the ground throughout the, the 24 hours uh, that includes the Queen's funeral. Well, for the last week, there have been, as you mentioned in the lead, uh, 10,000 police officers actually on the ground. But that is not the end of it. There's an additional 1,500 military personnel who've been brought in to man checkpoints and control, obviously, entry points around the Palace of Westminster. Because this has been set up pretty much as a security bubble, try and keep it as controlled as possible, obviously, in the advance of the funeral on Monday. Now, within the military contingent, there are going to be various different strands. Uh, but over and beyond them, uh, and within those strands will be things like special forces, for example, that will provide a quick reaction force capability should it be necessary. And they will be working with their counterterrorism mm. uh, SO15 counterparts. But there's also MI5, MI6 and GCHQ. And we have a very good experience of multi-agency coordination. And as I mentioned, obviously, this has been rehearsed for an awfully long time. You've worked on these events. You are a specialist in this field. What's keeping the person coordinating this event awake tonight? Well, I think, to be honest, again, these kinds of events will generally go over maybe a couple of days, and it may only be for a cluster or small handful of VVIPs. This is an enormous amount of people that are coming in. And this has been a week of basically events and various functions and people coming to see, obviously, Her Majesty lying in state. And 
this is a, a kind of exercise where you hold your breath and you hope that everything has been covered and everything has been thrown pretty much, you know, to the situation to try and keep it as secure and make it as secure as possible. But, you know, there's going to be a lot of anxious people until Tuesday, that's for sure. Well, as you said, it is a huge event, the biggest that London's ever seen, and London's seen most of them already. We really appreciate your time uh, this evening. We wish all those that are here on the ground the very best for what's ahead and can just congratulate London because it is amazing to see all the security, all the police, and yet smiles friendly. It's not in your face, and it's been a success so far. We wait and see. Again, today, I want to bring in Brigadier Mick Garraway from the Australian Army, who will be marching at the Queen's funeral tomorrow. Brigadier, good evening to you here in London. Uh, what an honour uh, for you and your company. Yeah, it's a, it's a tremendous opportunity. Uh, it's a great privilege for us to, to be involved in this uh, such a historic event. Well, take us through the process to be involved to get here. I mean, I'm assuming you knew uh, that if if the inevitable happened and the Queen did pass away, you'd be here. But what training, uh, what preparation and what will happen on Monday? Yeah, so um, uh, all of their contingents that are over here have been aware that for some time that we'd be required to, to deploy over here to London uh, in, the, uh, in the event of the Queen's death. So we're on a list, essentially. And, um, you know, we've been watching uh, watching the news in recent months and seeing... Uh, sadly, seeing the uh, the Queen's health decline, so um, you know it was it was no surprise in the end. Um, but of course, things happened pretty quickly. Most of us got the word uh, last Friday and uh, gathered in Sydney, and then flew uh, through Sunday and Monday over over here to London. Uh, and there's been a lot of rehearsals. Essentially, we've been uh, rehearsing the. Um, the parade itself uh, after hours here in London because of the requirement to close streets. Uh, but also there's been rehearsals conducted on a nearby army base called Burbright. Um, and, you know, the troops have been working hard really to prepare themselves for a, a style of a drill and a style of marching that we don't normally do in Australia. So uh, the troops have been working really hard, but they're looking forward to representing their country in this historic event. We're seeing some of the uh, the images of the training uh, as you were speaking there, because it's not just Australian troops. This is a, a Commonwealth Guard, correct, with people from uh, the United Kingdom, Canada, New Zealand as well. What's the camaraderie and what's the feel like with some of your counterparts from across the seas? Uh, look, um, you know, everyone's happy to, to work uh, together in this environment. Many of us, you know, clearly when we do deploy on operations, we're, we're often away with uh, the Brits, the Canadians and the, and the Kiwis. So it's great to get together in that in that Commonwealth team and and, uh, and and be part of such a historic event. Brigadier, a huge amount of pressure, but also a huge honour for you and the company. We thank you for your time and wish you all the very best on Monday for the funeral. Thank you. Well, we have Alexander the Great, William the Conqueror, and now royal biographers are looking for a nickname for Queen Elizabeth II. One idea, as recently suggested by former British Prime Minister Boris Johnson, is Queen Elizabeth the Great. But another is making headlines here in Britain, and it's come from the Church of England priest Reverend Richard Coles, who put forward Elizabeth the Dutiful. He joins us now. Uh, Reverend, good evening to you. It's great to have you on the program. How did you come up with this title? Well, I was trying to think of a word that summed up the character and the personality, I suppose, of the reign of Elizabeth II. I don't think Elizabeth the Great is right, actually, because the period that she has reigned over has been one pretty much of decline. But I think it's uh, that's not to her detriment. I think it speaks to her extraordinary quality and her qualities of steadfast duty and service. She vowed when she uh, became heir to the throne that she would serve uh, her life throughout all her life being long or short and that's exactly what she's done we live in a flaky age you know people won't even commit to lunch but to commit your entire life to the service of a country and the commonwealth i think is really remarkable so elizabeth the dutiful elizabeth the steadfast something like that history will judge yeah that all seems to make a lot of sense you've had the privilege of meeting the queen can you tell us about about that meeting and how that impacted your your choice of title well, I saw the Queen. I mean, I used to be chapped into the Royal Academy of Music in London, and the Queen was patron, so she used to come once a year and do the, do the things that the Queen did so beautifully: turn up, 
be well briefed, be charming to people, be interested in people, hand out the things that the Queen handed out and get in her car and go away again. And to see somebody doing that when it was maybe the sort of 30,000th time they'd done that was just very impressive. And the effect it had on people, it brought out the best in people. It galvanised their willingness to serve and commit themselves to. I saw that also in various charitable projects that I've been involved in. And she did have that power and and I think it's a unique power, really. I can't really think of anyone else who gets anywhere near it. King Charles III steps into that role himself now, of course. But it is a powerful and moving thing to see. Look, one of the suggestions from Kendall, our AP here, was Elizabeth the Enduring, which works as well for the same sentiment. Uh, but you mentioned King Charles III. Let's play sort of predictions. What would be a good nickname, do you think, for him coming forward, the Climate King or something like that? The Climate King would be very nice, wouldn't it? I mean, if King Charles... He's been ahead of, uh, you know, the discussion about uh, concerns about the environment for, you know, uh, for decades, in fact. Maybe that will be the issue around which his King Charles it will become to be identified. I don't know, it's, it's, it's too early to say. As we said, we're talking about people who have lives that are not just individual lives, but are corporate lives and historic lives. So it really is a judgment for history, I think. But the Queen, the late Queen, of course, we had her for 70 years on the throne. And I think in that time, what was most impressive about her was that, that commitment, that quality of unwavering service that has been such an example to so many people. Yeah, they've shaped the environment and shaped the event.